Okay. Two, one, and we thank you, up. everyone, for thank you for joining us, everyone, for this conversation about um, Keats Odes, a Lover's Discourse by Anahid Narcessian. John Keats was born in the last decade of the 18th century, like Shelley and Byron, part of a generation that came of age in the aftermath of the French Revolution when old political structures were in ruin and new ones were struggling to be born. He started publishing his poetry in 1816 during a great political swing to the right all across Europe um, with repressive and reactionary regimes in London, Paris or Vienna threatening fragile democratic gains. And he published his first poem, um, his first published poem was dedicated to Lee Hunt the radical editor and activist who had just been released from prison. And throughout his short career, Keats was relentlessly vilified by the conservative press as a result of his political beliefs. He wrote also in the midst of another revolution, the industrial one, at a time when it was becoming very clear that new forms of labor and production would generate fabulous wealth for the happy few and uh, staggering poverty and disenfranchisement for an unprecedented, unprecedented amount of people. He might have had a lot to say about our current moment. Uh, he died of tuberculosis in 1821 when he was 25 years old, two years after he had seen his brother collapse from the same disease, and also two years after writing his celebrated Six Great Odes in 1819. And tonight we're delighted to welcome Anahid Narcessian and Zoe Kaz uh, Kazan to discuss Narcessian's new book, Keats Odes, A Lover's Discourse. Anahid Narcessian is Associate Professor of English at UCLA. She previously, previously taught at Columbia University and holds a PhD in English literature from the University of Chicago. Keats Odes is her third book um, after the Calamity Forum on Poetry and Social Life and Utopia Limited, Romanticism and Adjustment. She's also the co-editor of a new book series from the University of Chicago Press called Thinking Literature. Zoe Kazan is an actor, playwright and screenwriter whom you'll remember from movies like The Big Sick in which she co-starred with Kumail Nanjani or Ruby Sparks, which she wrote, acted in, and produced. She's written four Broadway plays and also appeared in the TV series Olive Kittredge, for which she received an Emmy nomination and most recently in The Plot Against America. Um, there's always been two Keats, one the aesthete and escapist, the other the lowborn Republican radical. And a third one emerges from Narcessian's book, when it is the sum of the two and more, um, a, pro a poet so profoundly empathetic, so attuned to beauty and suffering that poetry in and of itself was a political act, a mode of connecting. And Keats Odes, A Lover's Discourse is a truly unique book. Um, it combines on the one hand, a supremely insightful, precise, original um, and also unaffected and completely jargon-free close reading of six of Keats' six great odes. And that's the um, highly sophisticated scholarship mode. And on the other hand, a willingness to let fragments from her personal life function as mirroring shards that capture reflections of Keats' own passion, his love and his vulnerability. And this would be the autobiographical or memoristic mode, although neither word is quite right. It's more accurately like an openness to risk, the risk of self-exposure, not gratuitously, but as a hermeneutic, as a key to a fuller reading of Keats's work. Self-exposure can also be political, especially when the person becoming visible, coming into focus, wasn't meant to be in the picture in the first place. And Narcessian's reading of these odes is political. She's speaking to an audience Keats couldn't have imagined, um, and I quote from the book, we exceptionally modern people, the immigrant, the feminist, the communist, the differently desiring. And she forges a connection to Keats across the centuries, opening up the canon to a broader readership, not by rounding off its edges for easier consumption, but by inviting us to bring our own resources to it. This is a pedagogical imperative, uh, imperative making these poems matter to us. It makes me wish that I could um, go back in time and sit in one of Narcessian's poetry classes and um, a political one, reading poetry as a radically perso personal but equally radically empathetic act, something not unlike love. 
Um, Nersessian and Kazan are close friends. And uh, Nersessian pointed out to me that, quote, in her own writing practice, Zoe's always been working through the pers personal and memoristic in a way I had never done. And I trusted her as a model and as a reader while I was writing Keats Odes. In other words, she was a kind of true north for me and a human gut check, things every writer needs, especially when they're doing something they've never done before, as I was with this book. It gives you a sense of her integrity as a critic. So let's get started. Without further ado, over to you, Anahid and Zoe. Oh, okay, well, thank you, Anthony. That was an incredibly amazing summary of the book and its ambitions. And I'm really grateful to you and to everybody who's helped organize this event. And also to Zoe for talking to me about the book even more than she's already talked to me about it, which is a lot. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna start just by reading you know, about three minutes worth of the very, very beginning of the book. It's actually not the very beginning of the book. There is a, a short preface, but I'm gonna read from the introduction uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of how the book sounds and, and the sort of constellation of issues that are in play. And like I said, it, it shouldn't take too long and, and then we'll start talking. John Keats was born on October 31st, 1795, and he died of tuberculosis on February 23rd, 1821, aged 25. In that narrow patch of existence, he composed some of the most unrepentingly alive poems in the English language. It is possible that had he survived, he would have written no more. Quitting had always been an option and he needed real money to support himself and his fiance, Fanny Braun. It is also possible that he would have kept writing and possible too that he would have burrowed even deeper into the broken heart of his century, which he knew was reordering time and space in answer to the demands of a new and rapacious economic system. George Bernard Shaw saw in Keats the makings of a full blooded modern revolutionist. And if he didn't reach the barricades, he did belong on them because there was nothing Keats loved more than us. Those who know this is not all we are meant to be. His poetry is a record of that love and its wild, inconvenient expression. It is a lover's discourse at once compassionate, exacting, indecent, and pure. This book collects six of Keats's poems known together as the Great Odes. I follow each ode with a short essay that is both critical and autobiographical, although the autobiographical dimension will not always be obvious. In that sense, the essays work like the odes. Odes, roughly speaking, are poems meant to celebrate something or someone, but because they are written from a place of emotional excess or ferment, it's easy for them to tip over into more private preoccupations. Thus, Percy Bysshe Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, which connects the cycle of the seasons to the here today, gone tomorrow movement of revolutionary struggle, also erupts into the furiously personal cri de cour, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. In writing about Keats's odes, I have tried to prop myself open to this same uneven traffic of literary and intimate concerns. This book then is a love story between me and Keats and not just Keats. Keats himself was famously lovable despite having been born, he said, into an unpromising morning. That sense of bleakness of having failed before he had begun dogged him. He was poor. He was short, six inches below average, and in ill health. Once he began publishing, his work was almost universally panned. He was temperamental, obsessive, and thin-skinned, and his childhood, which was traumatic, left him nervous, morbid, in the words of his brother, George. All the same, he amassed a small army of devoted friends, one of whom called him the most lovable associate that ever lived in the tide of times. Of his death, or perhaps their relationship, Braun wrote, I have not got over it, and never shall. When I say this book is a love story, I mean is it, it is about things that cannot be gotten over, like this world and some of the people in it. Oh, I love your book so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the first time I've gotten to hear you read from it. Um, you read so beautifully. Actually, I think it's the first time I've gotten to hear you read out loud since we were in college. So <laughs> that's, um, it's a rare pleasure for me. Um, you know, I've heard you talk about this book 
uh, in your talk that you had through the University of Chicago last week. And when asked, you know, like, why did you write this book? You said, because I was asked to write it. Um, <laughs> and I, and I know that that's true, but I also, um, I'm, I know also how long you've loved Keats, like longer than we've known each other even. Um, and I think that there must have been some part of you that that needed to write this book. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your history with Keats and how your understanding of him and of these odes changed over the 20 something years that you've been thinking about them. Sure. So yeah, it's true. I mean, I always wish that I had a more interesting origin story for the book, but the fact is I got more or less commissioned to do it by my editor. And I said, okay, because I didn't really have anything else that I was working on at the time. And it seemed like an opportunity that I had been looking for, which was um, to do work that was more public facing and, and more accessible to a general audience. So I kind of leaped at the chance. And uh, as soon as I had leapt at the chance, my editor said, okay, but you have to do it in three months. So I had very, very little time to write the book. And in a way that was great because as you said, I've been thinking about Keats for a really long time. So so there was a way in which I already had a pretty tight grip on the poems, which I've been teaching, you know, for not as long as I've been reading them, but I've been teaching them for a pretty long time too. So that part was easy. I, I knew in a sense, kind of, you know, what I wanted to say about the poems, or it was easy for me to get into the zone of what, it, what I wanted to say about the poems. But then, as you say, you know, a lot changed in the writing of the book. So I think one of the things that I discovered about Keats and about my relationship to Keats is that I had always had a little bit of hero worship around him. And you, you hear that a little bit in the introduction to the book, everyone had a little hero worship around Keats. You know, he was very lovable. His friends thought, you know, that he was just the most stand up guy. And he had a kind of, as I said, a real army of, of devoted friends and devoted fans and still does have an army of devoted fans who feel very, very close to Keats in a way that is probably more intimate and personal than most of us feel to historical or literary figures. And so I had some of that too. I had this hero worship about Keats and, and thought that he was just kind of you know, perfect in a way, not just a perfect poet, but a perfect person. And then in coming to the poetry, from a different perspective, you know, a perspective that was as much about the personal and the intimate as it was about the pedagogical, I discovered that he was, in fact, quite a difficult person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, that discovery or that recognition, you know, that Keats could, could really be, um, again, you know, very temperamental, um, very demanding, very um, sometimes, you know, sort of lordly and tyrannical, or like he would hate being described as lordly. Um, you know, that discovery did change my relationship to the poems. And in a way, it actually helped me see how the poems themselves are so much about the difficulty of being a human being. So they're very much about erotic suffering. They're very much about political suffering and, um, you know, just the suffering that comes with, with being a person in a body in a really hard, bad world. So that was new. You know, I had, I had never bought into the idea that Keats was simply the poet of sensuality and beauty. I had always thought that the poems were very rigorous, but I don't think I had appreciated the extent to which they're, um, you know, can be quite torturous sometimes. And so that was, that was, I think, probably the main thing that I, that I found in writing the book. Yeah. In a way, what you're describing is like later in the book, you talk about Ovid's metamorphosis and you talk about, um, you talk about this word, I'm going to mess, mess it up. Will you say it for me? Oh, oh, um, Ramalaskit. Yes, which we define it. It's like a way of talking about um, the bodies in transformation, like Daphne's body becoming a tree or Galatea's body unbecoming from a statue as the bodies is hardening and softening and then hardening and then softening. Yeah. And, and I felt like, oh, that's a little bit like what you're doing to Keats in this book. Like you're turning him from a statue into a person. Um, Oh, and, I love that. that's so great. I hadn't thought of I had not thought about it that way, but that's beautiful. Really? I was like, I think partially because there's so much iconography, like his death mask and the portrait that you talk about in the book. And like, there's a kind of like, um, like, like I can only see him on a pedestal. And, <laughs> and then reading your book, I felt like I, I felt like I was given I was given special access. Like when I, 
as you know, when I went to Keats's house in September, when I was in England, I, I was like, I was very, I, I felt like I had a skeleton key having read your book. Like I was like, oh, I can imagine a flesh and blood person here. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a funny feature actually of the Keats house that is in, in Hampstead, right? That you go in there and it actually feels as though the people who were living there had just left. It has this kind of magical energy about it. You think, oh, they've just stepped out to go to the supermarket or something and they'll be back any moment now. For some reason, it's frozen in a certain kind of liveliness that I think is really powerful. So I love, I mean, I love that. And I'm so glad that the book had that effect, not just on you, but had that effect on your picture of Keats. And yeah, I think that, you know, that, that Latin verb, which I, you know, is kind of a made up word, Ovid is using it to describe the softening of, of wax and then the hardening of wax and then the softening of wax. And he's using that as a figure for um, what it feels like when Pygmalion for the first time touches the, the body of his statue Galatea as she's becoming human, right? So her skin is softening or her flesh is softening. And I, I'm, you know, completely fascinated with Ovid's use of that verb. And I love the idea of that as a relationship that you can have to, you know, not just literature, but to a particular person or a particular idea of a person or a fantasy of a person. Because as we work over our relationships to poems, our relationships to people, right, we have all experienced that sense of them becoming sort of soft and then hard and then soft, right, calcifying in a particular image that we may have of them and then suddenly softening into something completely different, right? So our relationships with others, and again, of course, with literature also undergo a, a metamorphosis, right? That's perpetual. So I, I'm very happy that the book has had that effect on you or for you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something, um, uh, there's something in your book that has to do with the embodiedness that you were just referring to where I feel like, um, uh, the you 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 talk about how embodied his poetry is. You talk about the that he's sort of it, when you're talking about his negative capability, which we, we'll talk about in a second. But you talk about sort of like the POV of the cat, like him imagining himself into other bodies, and because you highlight that so early in the book, then as I was reading, I felt like I was sort of um, almost in the same way that I felt like when I was reading like the battle descriptions in War and Peace that like I could almost imagine like the film camera moving from one thing to another. So even in the poems that you like sort of posit as less good, like the um, Ode on Indolence, um, there's a sense that I had of like imagining him in his bed and having been in that room where his bed is, being able to imagine him like looking down at the foot of that bed. Um, what, what is my point? Um, that, that, that embodiedness also I think extends to the way you read these poems that you like read them in a very um in a way that's very connected to the experience of the body and to breath and to how we experience language physically and you say something about how the good reader uh, a good reader returns the text um I'm going to get this wrong I've written it down but expanded and altered and I think that that's so interesting. It is definitely my experience of reading, but I think that's partially because that's how I was trained to read <laughs> at Yale. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience of reading and of reading this poetry in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think it's absolutely right to say that I mean, my relationship to poetry is powerfully embodied as I think that most people's is. But I think that sometimes we make this mistake because poetry is such an intensely verbal art. We make a mistake of imagining that it takes place solely in the domain of um, you know, of explicit language, right? Or solely in the domain of the sound of a word. Mm -hmm. And of course that's partly true, but Keats famously is the poet who said, heard melodies are sweet, but unheard melodies, right, are sweeter. And so what do you do when you're trying to read a poet who lives so much in the space between words or a poet who lives so much in the word that is unsaid, right? And the, the word that because it's unsaid is also unheard. So you have to really activate a full body relationship to the poetry or to each of the poems that, that distends you, you know, and that sort of stretches your sensory capabilities beyond the limits of your own body. And for Keats, that's what negative capability was, right? To, to sort of 
push yourself. I mean, for him, it wasn't about pushing himself because he said it came so naturally to him. It was, it was sort of, you know, kind of helpless reaction to being around other people or other creatures or just other things. But you do as a reader, I think, have to push yourself to live a little bit beyond your own body. When you read any poem, not just a poem by Keats, even though these poems perhaps really foreground the necessity of, of that kind of um, distension. So yeah, I think that's exactly right. And so for me, when I read one of these poems or when I read poems by other people that I love, I, you know, I feel it everywhere, right? And, and that's where the poem lives. It lives in that feeling, you know, it lives in that sort of zone that's just beyond the limits of your own skin. And so then what were, I was going to say something else you were saying about, oh, reading. Yeah, I once got in a kind of trouble at <laughs> an academic event for saying I didn't think that what teachers did or what literary critics did was tell people what a text says. I, I thought that what we did was presented a slight distortion of the text in order to provoke people to think something new and different about it. And I think that that's, I still think that's true, even though I think nobody liked hearing me say that, maybe it seemed like it was irresponsible in some sense, but I do think that learning requires a certain kind of distortion of what is already known. So, you know, and what's great about Keats's poetry is it's sometimes so profoundly weird that it encourages that kind of distortion. You know, it itself runs a certain distortion on the world in order to prompt us to imagine how that world might be different. So a, for me, a responsible critic has to match that in their own reading too. Yeah, I find that really interesting. I find it interesting partially because I think for, I think because of the way that poetry is taught as as being like venerated or I mean like my early not 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 at a higher learning level but our first experience of poetry I think is that it's like dead essentially mm -hmm. like I think that's a lot of people's experience of it and I think that like as cringy as it may be I think that that's why like my English teacher in high school was like it's like rap you know like <laughs> I feel like it was like a yeah. way of trying to be like it's alive like this is not this is not a dead object this is that we've preserved in amber for you because we think it's important like yeah. that Grecian urn like or the way that 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 Grecian urn sort of operates right in a museum mm -hmm. it's like something that you can use it's like a Grecian urn that you have in your house and you fill it with grape juice and you drink it like I feel like there's something about that that makes it that makes people come to the page, or at least I think the average person come to the page with some sense of like, there must not be something that could speak to me right now here. Like there must be beauty here. And that has made this something worth preserving. And there must be like culture here. And that has made this something worth preserving. But the thing of like, I am speaking to you and putting my finger between your ribs, like that thing that you point out that you sort of not just point out that you like, you put you you shine a flashlight into in this book it i think it's i think it's like a much <laughs> a better invitation to reading than saying this is what this poem is about well i hope so i mean i'm so I, I hate that kind of pandering, especially to students, right? The idea that it has, like poetry has to be, or, you know, let's say it's 19th century poetry has to be connected to another kind of art form that is, you know, much more legible in the 21st century in order for students to be captivated by it. You know, um, I always get so irritated by that because I feel like it just treats students as fools. And also, I mean, in, in that example too, it also flattens out the, the historical specificity and like just profound, originality of rap and hip hop, you know? And so, yeah. And yeah, so yeah, I mean, those that, that kind of story always makes me totally nuts. But yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think that, you know, one thing I've discovered um, among my undergraduates that I find very surprising is that they're much more open to poetry than you might necessarily expect. So, and interestingly enough, my undergraduates love Keats and I'm always taken aback by that because I always think, well, what is, you know, like, you know, what has Keats to do with life in Southern California and in, in the middle of a pandemic or, you know, in whatever, and it turns out quite a lot. And my students seem to understand that in a really intuitive way. And I actually think that it goes back to this sense that Keats, I'm not gonna borrow your, image because I love it so much that Keats really pokes you between the ribs and they respond to that you know they they feel grabbed 
by him, even if they don't necessarily know why. And certainly when I started reading Keats, I was like, you know, embarrassingly young, like 11 or 12. Certainly when I started reading Keats, that's what I was responding to because I couldn't make heads or tails out of the language. You know, I couldn't tell you what any of those lines said yeah. in, in a straightforward way. But yeah. I, I absolutely felt as though, you know, someone had, had grabbed me, you know, by the viscera and and forced me to to listen you know or to just be alive in the presence of this poetry that is itself really alive so yeah I love that the ribs image well that was how I felt at that age at exactly that age at 11 I had this terrible bout of insomnia for like a year I've talked to you about this and I read um Shakespeare's complete works which we had bound in our house um, during that time. And, and like you, I think uh, probably, you know, at least 60% of the language went over my head, but I remember feeling like, like I like shocked, like, <laughs> like that there was something so exciting about what I could find there. Um, I want to talk a tiny bit about, about, um, your writing process on this, um, you, you say it, you say something in the introduction, you say an ode by Keats is just that an anchorage for big feelings that in their sheer ungovernable uh, ungovernability test what it might be like to be really free. And I feel like you took that a little bit as like your credo in writing this book, like that you gave yourself a lot of freedom. Um, as you said, this is a different mode of writing for you. Your previous two books are for an academic audience. Um, or like, I don't even know if you would call it audience readership. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, um, I'm just wondering what it felt like for you to write in that, what it was like for you to write in that mode, whether you wrote in a straight line, like, did you write these in order? Did you write them out of order? And also um, like, how do you go back and edit yourself when you are hmm. taking up a credo of freedom for yourself, which I felt so much in this writing? Well, I did write the book in, I mean, I wrote the chapters in the order in which they appear. And partly I wanted to do that because I wanted to force myself to just deal with each ode as it came up, right? So the first chapter is about Ode to a Nightingale, which is a very, very famous poem. And the second chapter is about Ode on the Grecian Urn, which is also a very, very famous poem. So the first two chapters necessarily began with these incredible challenges, right? You know, how can you say something new about these poems that so much ink has been spilled over? You know, what new could you possibly have said? And then the middle three chapters are about the three odes that are perhaps lesser known. So it required a certain shift of gears. And so I wanted to be in, in the movement of, you know, that relationship to something really famous and something a little bit more obscure. And then I should also say um, that the, the chapters appear or the odes appear in the book in the order in which they were written or, or as best we know the order in which they were written. So there's a slight artificiality to the order, but for me, you know, I just decided that I would force myself to obey historical chronology come what may. But the harder thing, and, and Anthony kind of touched on this in, its, in, in his introduction is that I praise Keats so much in this book for being a poet of a, a kind of, I think I called it at some point, relentless self-exposure to the world and being a poet who was unacquainted with the idea of going too far. And uh, I knew that I would not be being faithful to the book if I didn't push myself to adopt a certain kind of um, self-exposure as well. And that's very, very hard for me to do because as you know, <laughs> as, as you know, um, I'm quite private, you know, and quite guarded. And it's very uncomfortable for me to introduce any kind of personal content into my writing and always has been. And for a long time, I've thought of that as an ethical position. You know, I've thought of keeping a pretty intense or rigorous separation between myself and the work as something that, again, a sort of responsible critic does. And I also enjoy doing that. I get a lot of pleasure out of entering utterly into the consciousness of um, you know, a, a text that I have no relationship to whatsoever and just entering into, the, into another consciousness full stop. So it was really, really hard for me given my personality to introduce any kind of personal material into the book, but I really forced myself to do it. And once I had done it, this, um, you know, as I said, because I had so little time to write the book, I only had about three months to write it. 
I couldn't really second guess anything that I had written. You know, I couldn't stop and say, well, this is really going too far. or This is really too much. Or um, this is giving too much away as I do when I write an email, you know, as I do all the time. Right. And so because I couldn't do that, the, the writing of the book felt, I hesitate to say therapeutic, but it felt therapeutic or it felt cathartic because there was so much that was very close to the surface in me. I mean, emotionally very close to the surface, a lot of turmoil, and suddenly it had an outlet that it hadn't had before. And in terms of editing or revising, there's one chapter in the book, it's the, it's the middle chapter um, on the Ode to Melancholy, where I, that chapter, I think I revised more than I've revised anything I've ever written ever. And, and one paragraph in particular, I must have worked over tweaked, you know, 50 times. So I'd be falling asleep and I would suddenly spring awake and, you know, get out my phone and pull it up because I had a, a PDF on my phone, pull it up and then quickly go in and like make notes to myself about how I should change it. And I would just be changing things like prepositions. You know, I would be changing the placement of a comma or something like that because it had become very, very important to me to get that chapter and in particular that paragraph just right. So I didn't want the move toward emotional effusion to then distract me from my responsibility to be true to experience, you know, just like I tried to be true to a, a poem. I also wanted to be true to experience. So, yeah, but it was, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to write anything quite this personal again anytime soon, but it was a really incredible experience for me. Yeah. Well, you know, on that note, and we, we don't need to linger on this, but privately, we've talked a little bit about the use of the word vulnerable in some of the <laughs> yeah. reviews of your book and how, what, what, what gendered praise that is like how, I mean, one thing I sort of took note of, and I could be wrong, but like so many of the people who have reviewed your book are men. And, um, I think it's only, uh, I I think am, it's only been reviewed by men. I think that's at least as far right. as I can tell. What I've what I've what I've been sent by my by my editor has only been written by men. But God bless them all. But <laughs> it is true. I mean, I don't think it's anyone's fault, you know, <laughs> uh, any one particular person's fault. Um, but I do think that I do think that um conf for lack of a better word, confessional writing, like you know, personal writing, it, it is, we, we do separate out, I think, the way that we think about men writing that way and the way that we think about women writing that way. And I think that like, you know, the way that we sort of like, <laughs> um, I don't know, like the, the kind of like the, the big old parentheses we put around Taylor Swift or like, you know, um, the, you know, the, even in like a more serious way, like how, how those like, you know, now scarred books, or I forget how you pronounce that guy's name, like that there's a kind of sense of like when men write in a certain autobiographical mode, it's like daring, <laughs> it's like pioneering and important. Um, and I feel like women get get a little bit of like a pat on the back for being emotional. And I, and I feel that actually, I, it's something that I, <laughs> it's, some, it's, it's not just because of the way that those things are received, like it's also how we, we we're queued up for it as a culture. Like yeah. I, I think I've said this to you before, but like there was a certain point in my relationship with my partner, Paul, you know, who's an actor where I was like every audition that I ever do, I'm asked to cry and you are never asked to cry in the audition. Wow. Um, and it feels to me like a not, a not dissimilar thing of like what we're sort of primed to expect. Yeah, I think, you know, I've, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think in this, the response to the book, and, and it is true, it's this curious thing where the, the book is, um, has been praised uh, for, for being vulnerable, and I've been praised for allowing myself to be vulnerable. Now, on the one hand, as somebody who in her own personal life is never characterized as vulnerable, even though I feel, you know, like I have no shell whatsoever. <laughs> Um, I don't, I feel like a very vulnerable person. I'm, I'm often, I think, you know, sort of misrecognized, although I should take some responsibility for that misrecognition. I'm also like misrecognized as being very tough and, and very 
um, you know, self-possessed. And I think that's just a function of like having dark hair and being from New York and talking fast. Like, you know, I mean, I think that that's what prompts that particular kind of misrecognition because I just am a total jellyfish as anyone who knows me knows. But so I've actually been really gratified when people call the book vulnerable because part of me thinks, oh, finally, you know, <laughs> finally people see, you know, like, I'm completely pathetic, right? So I'm so glad that people have seen that. Um, but I have noticed it, and I think that it's partly a response to what people expect of criticism or what people mm -hmm. expect of critics. And there is this expectation among the general public, I think, or you know, the kind of public that would pick up a book like this, that a literary critic speaks to you, or you know, literary critic university professor speaks to you from a position of unassailable authority or what they perceive to be unassailable authority. And that's so antithetical from the way uh, to the way that I approach my own criticism or my own teaching. You know, I mean, if I'm in a classroom, I'm a, an authority in a very basic sense that, you know, I've been doing this much longer than any of my students have. I've been reading this poetry for much longer than they have, and I've received a certain kind of training. But I, I would never presume to come in and say, I'm going to tell everybody their business and you have to receive these poems the way that I hand them to you. I would, mm -hmm. I would never think that. I don't even see what the fun in that would be. So it, I think that it's partly a reaction on the part of readers to their own surprise that somebody who is a critic and a professor would, would be open in this particular way. And that makes me sad for how criticism is perceived in the public sphere, you know? Mm. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that, I mean, one of the things that reminds me of is, and I know that reviewers are different than critics, but, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like when I read a film review that has a lot of personal content in it, that ha that that includes the viewer in the picture, mm -hmm. it helps me understand not just <laughs> what that person's POV is in their other writing, um, but also it allows me to sort of like think about um, a critical response as being an invitation to your own subjective response and yeah. not like the voice of God coming down. Um, I, it's something I so appreciate. And it reminds me actually of the way that kind of that Keats puts his body in the room, mm -hmm. that, that it's like a similar position of allowing your, your like mortal body to be included in, 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 you went and not divorced from your brain. Yeah. Well, the whole thing, the, the passage in which I'm going to get this confused, which is embarrassing, but you know, because Keats describes negative capability in a couple of different places, but only once does he actually call it negative capability. But there's this famous passage in one of his letters where he says, um, you know, if I'm out at a party, uh, and then he says, not myself comes home to myself, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and, and he goes on to say, for when I am in a room with other people, the identity of everyone else there begins to so press upon me that I am in a very little time annihilated. And that's always been my relationship to reading as extreme as that sounds. And so that does require a certain kind of, um, you know, openness to being a body in the room with the body of the poem, you know? So the poem begins to press upon you as though it is a physical entity and not just, you know, of like black print on a white page. So, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, the kind of criticism that has always had the most meaning to me, like the kind of poetry that has always had the most meaning to me is a poetry that opens itself to that kind of annihilation and that provokes that kind of annihilation in others. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting. I was going to ask you about this because you say late in the book, you say um, you, you're you talking about being a critic and you say, um, the truth is there is no voice I don't hear louder than my own. Um, and I, <laughs> I really related to that. You're talking about earlier in the book about ne negative capability. And um, I'm just going to read what you write about it because I think it, for those that don't know, it's helpful. Um, uh, the best poets, Keats says, are chameleon. They change to match their surroundings, sometimes entering fully into the psychic and sensational orbit of other beings. Keats gave this talent a name. It was negative capability, and he had it to spare. It's kind of like a, a very strong radical empathy. And um, I, I feel that so much in my own work. It, it has made it very hard for me sometimes to hold on to my own critical faculties, though. Like, I experience it in a way where I feel like... Um, Sometimes I feel like uh, uh, 
I, my authority is taken away. I, it, away from myself through my empathy, not given back to me through it. So I found your writing about that from a critical perspective, really interesting. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I keep mentioning this every time I do interviews about this book, which shows that it was probably a more profound part of the book than I let on in the writing, but both my, as you know, both my parents are psychoanalysts and they're very old fashioned psychoanalysts. So they're, they're old school Freudians. And so they really have a sense that the job of the analyst is to completely, you know, evacuate themselves from the analytic situation so that they really are a certain blank slate onto which, you know, the analysis or the patient can project whatever they need to. And then additionally, when I was growing up, my parents had their offices in the, in the house where I grew up. And because they were so old school, it was very important to them that their patients not know that they had any children, well, that they had any children, that they know anything about them whatsoever. So anytime a, a patient would be coming or going, I would have to duck into another room or, you know, like hide behind the stairs. I'd be very quiet and stop doing whatever I was doing so that, you know, that person could um, enjoy whatever fantasy they had about my parents being completely atomized beings with no family, no personality, you know, no life outside of the, mm. the analytic space. And so, um, being psychoanalysts, my parents have often said to me, oh, you know, we must have bequeathed that to you in a certain way, you know, that certain habit of, you know, a, a habit of self-effacement. And I do think that that's why, to the extent that I'm a good literary critic, and I think I'm an okay one, you know, to the extent that I do anything good as a critic, I think I do it for that reason, that I do have a certain learned ability to absent myself from you know situations and um, that's what, exactly what Keats is describing as negative capability I think now in the end of, <laughs> in the end of the book I think that that remark I make about not being able to hear any voice louder than my own is is delivered with a fair amount of resentment because the the end of the book is meant to be the most directly and explicitly personal moment in in the, the book and so Part of what I was trying to express there was the, how difficult it is for me to hear my own voice, you know, and mm -hmm. to present my own perspective or even to know what my own perspective is, because I do feel very easily taken over by the perspective of others or just by the, um, what's the word I'm looking for, by, it's very, very easy for me to assume that someone else's emotion is the authority in any given situation, right? And that my own is has has no rights in a certain way, you know, or that my own is irrelevant or that my own is, um, flaw, you know, flawed or, or um, fallacious in some way or, or embarrassing. And so that partly that that statement comes at the beginning of the postscript to the book as a as a way of um, expressing a certain kind of frustration with myself uh, about my, you know, a frustration with my own hesitancy to try to hear my own voice or to try to make my voice hearable to others. Mm. Yeah, that postscript is so beautiful. And it is it is like the odes, a moment of direct address. Um, the only moment really like that in the book. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, it just occurred to me for the first time when you were when you were talking about it and talking about it it's sort of off talking about your parents that you're that you are sort of presenting a series of dreams at the end of the. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, how embarrassing! <laughs> it's all it's all psychoanalysis from top to bottom. I mean, I think that even you're in, I mean, cause you talk about Freud a couple of times in the book and I, I, again, you say like, I'm not trying to put Keats in the chair, which I believe. Um, I found it again, like a kind of way of trying to include the body in the room. Um, and, and like, you know, I, I have a certain amount of my own skepticism as a, as a person who's putting creative output into the world about how, how much autobiography should come into how we understand a, a piece of art. Um, I, I have, I don't have a, a judgment about it. I just have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of conflicting thoughts about it. Um, and uh, yet you talk about like sort of um, allowing his damage to be part of his perspective, I guess, um, which I think is very compelling. Yeah, I mean, I think 
you know, and I also just say, um, and my friend Anthony Madrid, who's a, a wonderful poet, read the book in manuscript. And there's a line in the in the introduction when I say that, you know, um, the part of the reason that I love Keats is because of Keats's damage, and that it's hard not to love other people's damage, right? And my friend Anthony, or at least it is for you, or at least it's hard for me. It's been hard for me not to love other people's damage. And my friend Anthony got so mad at me about that line. And he said, you know, gosh, like, you know, what a terrible person you are. It's not hard not to love other people's damage, you know? And he sort of raked me over the coals about it, which I was very glad for. I had given him the manuscript partly because I knew he would rake me over the coals about it. But I think that's just true. You know, I think that who, who hasn't been, you know, in a sense, um, seduced by the vulnerability of others is not the same thing as being glad that people have had the experiences that they have, or that, you know, you're glad that Keats went through all the stuff that he did in his childhood, which, as I said, was, was quite traumatic, probably more traumatic than most biographers have given it credit for. But that's just, that's sort of how things shake out in this world, right? Yeah. And I do, I do think that, you know, Keats's poetry, and I've, I've written about this, not just in this book, but in my academic work too, I mean, Keats's poetry is very stressed out in, in the sense that it seems to always be operating under an incredible and all-encompassing pressure against which it strains, you know? And that, I, I can't think that Keats would have learned that from anything other than the difficulties that he had in his childhood. You know, yeah. and then to a certain extent, you know, some of the difficulties he's, he experienced as an adult who didn't have a lot of money and couldn't really do what he wanted to easily in the world. But I do think that some of those childhood experiences around um, the, the sort of disappearance and then loss of his mother were absolutely foundational to the poetry, even though, of course, he never writes about those things in any uh, in any kind of autobiographical way, even in his letters. You know, I mean, so it's not in the letters, it's not in the poetry, but it is just a fact of, it's a set of facts about his life that I think are absolutely, you know, integral to any understanding of the poetry, even if we don't map the, the biography in a kind of one-to-one -one relationship onto the poems. I think it's a set of emotional and psychological habits that have been learned in infancy or in childhood that then get translated into the poetry in a way that is just undeniable. But I will say about the, you mentioned at the beginning of your question, you said something also about the end of the poem, you know, or the end of the poem, that, uh, the end of the book. One of the things that has made me very uh, anxious about the way readers have talked about the postscript to the book, a lot of people say kind of moment that comes at the, at the book's end. And I'm, I'm so dismayed, <laughs> I'm so dismayed by that because I have absolutely no identification with the position of the poet. I've never wanted to write poetry, you know? And um, so whenever people say to me, oh, this moment at the end of the poem is very poetic or it's very lyrical, I, I get very, very tense. And I think, well, that was absolutely not my intention. So don't read it that way, please. You know, in fact, part of the, the difficulty and the purpose behind that postscript was in fact to write something that unlike poetry and unlike fiction doesn't get to have the mantle of indirection or doesn't get to have you know the alibi that it's not really real you know or even if it's kind of in some oblique relationship to the real that's not what that it's not limited by that so you know like Keats's sonnet Bright Star which is a very you know famous poem that I don't write about and don't particularly like um, people know that that poem is about Fanny Braun and they read it as a poem about Fanny Braun, but that's not all the poem is, you know? And that's not all the poem can do is be about Fanny Braun. And that's part of the magic of poetry if that doesn't sound too, too cheesy. But nonfiction prose of the kind I write, I think always has, you know, again, to use this phrase, always has a kind of self-exposure built into it because it doesn't have that protection. You know, it doesn't have the ability to say, well, yes, it's sort of about this, but it's really also about this. You know, it's just, it's about whatever it, it says. And so it was, you know, it's very important to me that the ending of the book be understood as prose because of the obligation to truth that I think prose has. Yeah. Well, you say at some point early in the book about Keats, like that he's not a poet who's interested in symbolism. And um, I feel like this is like in some ways an extension of that. 
like, you know, the, the woods are the woods an island is an island. A thorn is a thorn. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, one place that I feel like I, I, I have so much more that I could talk to you about one place that I, I just wanted to touch on. That's a, a, a specific to one of the chapters is, um, is in Ode to Psyche, because I feel like um, that pressure that you're talking about, that like pressure cooker thing, in a way feels like it lifts in that poem a little bit. Like there's like more of a sense of freedom. And like one thing I I, I wrote to you uh, privately about this, but um, you know, I was very struck reading it both the first time I read your manuscript and then reading it again and, uh, as the final book. Um, of, of this like repetition of Keats's of almost a full of like half a stanza where he's listing like all of the sort of parts of a religious ceremony or or parts of a temple and then he sort of offers himself as that temple and he does this sort of recitation and to me it felt almost like um like an anatomy lesson <laughs> like like that he's moving through the parts of a body or something that there's something very sensual about that repetition but the other thing that I really felt was that it had room to repeat itself that it didn't feel like it was like in that same crucible that turns a lump of coal into a diamond like that there was something else happening like a window being opened like it like it is at the end of the poem um we talk a little bit about that you don't talk about that repetition in the chapter so I'm not asking you to rehash anything <laughs> Yeah, so th the description of the poem is so beautiful and also rings so true to me. And, you know, I often tell people that, you know, the Ode to Psyche is my favorite of the odes. It's my favorite Keats poem. And then sometimes in certain temperaments or certain moods, I'll say it's actually my favorite poem in the English language, which always takes people by surprise because it's not generally counted among, you know, great works of literature. And a lot of Keats critics will say that this poem, a lot of people believe actually that it was written first which I don't think is true but so um you know a lot of people think here's the dry run right which is why there's this unnecessary repetition in it it's why it's much longer than the other odes it's sort of um metrically it's all over the place you, you know I mean, it's a bit kind of messy and sprawling but I think that you're exactly right I actually think that that ode is trying to perform a certain kind of freedom and it's the freedom found in in two things which for Keats are closely related a, an intimate relationship that is predicated on a, a kind of, you know, again, radical honesty or certain kind of radical exposure to the, to the other, you know, between self and other, um, which is figured in the beginning of the poem in the, the side-by-sideness of, of Cupid and Psyche. And then the other thing which for Keats is related, um, you know, is this idea that we might one day be free of all the bad aspects of civilization. We might be liberated into being simply bodies in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And in the poem, it, the poem kind of takes this very tentative step towards suggesting that one of the bad aspects of civilization that we might one day be able to transcend would be gender. And right. uh, that's in there along with religion, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. And so, um, I think that that's such a you know brilliant reading of the your reading of the poem is so brilliant because it's exactly that the poem is enacting in its form as well as in its explicit content a certain kind of liberation or a principle of liberation. So I actually think that poem, for all its messiness or because of its messiness, might represent the the pinnacle of Keats's thought, you know, and, and especially Keats's political thought. So. Yes, I'm glad that you also think of, of Psyche in those terms. Oh, I I fell in love with your favorite poem. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I also wondered whether it might not be in some ways, like, because I just don't know about the marriage ceremonies of that time, like the call and response, like the way that we say my, you know, I give you, we repeat in a marriage ceremony exactly the words that we've said and we say mine and yours in the same way that, that he sort of does here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, I didn't, you know, the way that that chapter ends is by talking about this, um, uh, the this Sumerian poem about the marriage of, of the goddess Inanna and this shepherd, right? And partly the reason it does that is because the, the chapter talks about um, Alice Notley's The Descent of Alet, you know, which is one of my favorite, also one of my favorite works of literature, but, um, you know, and, and she, Notley is thinking about the myth of Inanna, who's one of these goddesses who, like Psyche, goes down into the underworld for you know a sort of transformative experience through which her her soul you know is is essentially um 
you know, activated, right? You know, I mean, it's mm. like he sort of says about Psyche that her her trials make her, you know, make her into a soul being, you know, and in fact, the the embodiment of the soul, the human soul. So I wanted to think about that and the idea of the sort of descent into the underworld and how that's such a, you know, a, a widely repeated theme within, you know, human civilization, whatever. Um, but yeah, so the, the chapter ends with a discussion of this particular poem, which is all basically call and response. You know, so I hadn't made that explicit connection with the repetition in Ode to Psyche, but I think that that's terrific. Um, so we're going to move to audience questions now because we just have a few minutes left and we have we have a bunch here that just got sent to me. Um, oh. <laughs> um, uh, Jen asks, is there a particular key to biography you swear by? You know, there are a few, there were three written all in the 1960s, kind of all within a couple of years of each other. One by um, Walter Jackson Bate, which is I think just called John Keats. Um, one by a guy named Robert Giddings, which may also have that exact same name. And then one by um, a woman named Eileen Ward, which is called John Keats, The Making of a Poet. And that one is actually my favorite. So it's often to go back to the discussion about vulnerability and femininity and criticism. It's the one that's most often dismissed as being too emotional and mm -hmm. having too much of a, um, you know, intense attachment to Keats to be a truly objective biography. But I actually think that one is just beautiful and, and kind of gripping. And so that's the one that I would recommend. And that there certainly have been, you know, biographies of Keats written more recently, but I, I would go to Eileen Ward first. Um, Ali asks, which writers do you feel influenced you the most as you wrote this book? Were there other pieces or books that you used as models? Yeah, gosh, there were so many. I mean, you know, some of my favorite, um, you know, critical writing actually comes from the domain of fiction or what I guess this might sometimes be called experimental fiction, although I think it's kind of a strange term, but um, the writer Barbara Browning, the novelist Barbara Browning is was a huge influence on this book. And I talk about her, um, novel, The Correspondence Artist in Ode to, the chapter that's on the Ode to Indolence. And so I would say that Barbara Browning's work, which combines uh, you know, sort of, um, what we would now, I think, probably call something like auto fiction, although there's another term that I think is just sort of, you know, like totally jarring and, and metallic in all the wrong ways. Um, uh, her work combines a certain kind of auto fiction with, you know, theory. And, and I wanted to write in the kind of uh, playful while also a uh, very passionate way that she does. So I would say Barbara Browning for one and um, you know all sorts of other you know critics have penetrated the book or permeated the book in ways that I probably can't even name but that's who jumps that's whose name jumps out first. Um, Megan asks about um, the framing of a lover's discourse and um, I, I meant to ask you about that and 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 why that why that framing came to you. So, Roland Barthes' book, A Lover's Discourse, which is uh, appropriately enough a very beloved book, <laughs> has a sort of a fundamental premise, which is that to speak a lover's discourse is always to speak to someone who is absent. And there are all sorts of reasons for that, right? You know, maybe the person is absent because the relationship didn't work out, you know, but for Bart, you know, sort of more underneath that is this idea that the person that we love is always to some extent a person who doesn't exist. You know, we've sort of imagined them or we've sort of fantasized about them. We've projected things onto them. And, um, you know, th so the love object is actually always a kind of fantasy object, even if it's a really existing person. And so in that sense, to speak to them is to speak to a being who doesn't exist. And so, my book is interested in a few different scenes of speaking to a, a person who, you know, is unable to respond or who doesn't exist, most obviously my speaking to Keats, you know, but then it's also the case, and, and Anthony kind of read this part of the book in his introduction, it's also the case that the book is interested in how I also, I, I personally, you know, as a, as a person who I'm female, I have, um, you know, an, a parent who is an, an Iranian immigrant. Um, I uh, have all sorts of, you know, like political beliefs that would not have been particularly legible to Keats. I also can't exist for Keats, you know, like there is no way that in 1819, Keats would be able to imagine someone like me writing a book about his poetry, 
that's sort of just not a historical possibility for him. So uh, the book was also partly about that. You know, what does it mean to uh, have a profound attachment to someone who can't imagine you, right? As mm-hmm. in a way that Keats can't imagine me. So the, the book has many, you know, scenes of speaking to someone who is not there or um, feeling as though you're operating at a, at a insurmountable distance from something or someone to whom you feel extraordinarily close and extraordinary and with whom you feel extraordinarily involved. So that's why the lover's discourse. Um, I think this will be our last question um, because we're running out of time. I, I really love this question. And um, I, Julie asks, has writing this book changed how you teach or did teaching change how you wrote it? That is a great question. I want to say that it probably is the latter. It's probably that teaching changed how I wrote the book. You know, I mean, I think of myself, um, I don't want, yeah, maybe I think of myself foremost as a teacher. You know, I had this funny experience and I've related this before um, in talking about this book, but I had this funny experience where a student came into my office, not recently, obviously, because I haven't been there recently as none of us have been in our offices too recently. Um, But I was in my office and a student came in and was kind of emotionally overwrought about something else. And in talking to me about what was sort of going on, he said, um, all of us think it's so moving the way that whenever you teach Ode to Psyche, you cry. (laughs) And it was news to me that I cry when teaching Ode to Psyche. I was not aware that I had been crying while teaching this poem. And the student had taken a number of classes with me. So if it's something that I was doing, I I did it more than once. And um, it was clear, I had never, hearing that student say that it had been very meaningful to him and to other students for me to introduce any kind of emotional content into the classroom, I think emboldened me to write this book, you know, and, and made me think that maybe that, that stuff is valuable. Maybe it is actually intellectually stimulating as well as, you know, entertaining, as I'm sure it's very entertaining to see your professor cry without realizing that she's crying. So yeah, I would say that, you know, everything that I write is in some sense for my students, but I think that this book really is. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, This has been such a pleasure for me. And uh, I just want to thank, thank you for asking me to talk about this with you and thank 192 Books. Yeah, well, thank you, Zoe. As always, as always, it's awesome to talk to you. Thank you both. That was a great, great conversation. Um, and uh, you say actually, and I hate in your book that um, if you've never read anything on Keats' odes before, Keats's odes before, this book should not be your first stop. But I, I kind of disagree. I think it's a great, um, it's a great way, a great place to start, just because the close readings are so, so well done. I mean, so um, precise and you really, you really hear the poem um, and you really pay attention to the, um, to, uh, to the, the meter and, and uh, to the images and, and so on. So just that is an education uh, about reading Keats. And then it just kind of gives you the energy to just go on and, and, and read more. So um, anyway, thank you both for, for the conversation. This was really great. Um, this is the book. Keats's Odes, A Lover's Discourse, and it is available at 182 Books, uh, which is on 10th Avenue be- between 21st and 22nd Street. We are open for safe, socially distant browsing every single day from 11 to 5 and until 6 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. You can also reserve copies by mail by uh, sending an email um, to info at 192books.com. And uh, you can also use our bookshop page to purchase the book. Uh, The link should be right below the screen. Uh, There'll be a recorded version of this uh, conversation uh, posted on pcgstudio.com. And check our books, our our website for future events. uh, And have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.